Uh, hello, everyone. You know, thank you for gathering a very early morning because I'm not so good at you know, working out the actually early morning. Uh, I'm very happy to you know, moderate this session, uh, you know, uh, the real world application with the blockchain. So actually, this is my first time to moderate the session, so I'm a little bit nervous, but I will, I will enjoy it. So now, today, uh, we know that you know, a lot of like, you know, blockchain platform players coming up, you know, Ethereum is one of the famous one, but also like you know, IOTA and as like, you know, any other kind of like, you know, platform player is coming up too. So it looks like the protocol layer of the blockchain is you know, developing you know, gradually and you know, well and well. So the probably next you know, kind of a key thing for this industry is uh, mass adaptation of the blockchain technology to the world. So here we have the five panelists working on like a computer consumer facing or you know, B2B facing uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin application player here. We call, so, call it DAPS, DA, you know, distributed applications. So before starting the session, could you guys introduce yourself? Uh, so could you start starting from Chris? Sure. My name is Chris C. I am the founder of the Costack project and also the head of product. Uh, we are building the decentralized layer of the, of the decentralized internet, which is basically building from the user experience downwards and figuring out how to make blockchain, multiple blockchain applications come together to solve business problems uh, so it's usable and scalable. Okay. Uh, my name is Martin, Martin Lim. I'm the COO of Electrify. And what Electrify does is to put electricity retail and peer-to-peer -peer energy trading across a citywide grid on the blockchain. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Hope. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Exim Chain. We're doing export import on the blockchain. We're building the first public blockchain that supports privacy, security, and scalability for supply chain applications. We've been exploring this field from MIT since 2015, and we're currently building our proof of concept with a sourcing platform in China that has over 30,000 small and medium-sized business users. Okay, so, ah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Raphael, I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Alice. Uh, we're a social impact network that's built on Ethereum. The goal of the network is to help identify and then scale really effective social and environmental projects. Um, and uh, the first application that we put out last year that's in production already is a conditional donation platform. Uh, so we ran a pilot uh, with a charity helping homeless people, uh, helping them find accommodation and deal with mental health issues, for example. But when you uh, give to a project on Alice, your money only gets paid out when the charity can show, can prove that it's achieved its goal. <coughs> Sorry, its goals, uh, meaning that it uh, it instills a lot of trust in donors. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Gittleson. I'm uh, the co-founder of Virtue Poker. Uh, we're a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized online poker platform built on Ethereum. Uh, we use a combination of a off-chain peer-to-peer card shuffling alg algorithm with on-chain smart contracts. And our goal is to, to build a safe and secure online poker platform uh, for everyone to enjoy. Great. Thank you so much, guys. So uh, let's open to my first questions. So uh, why... Oh, I'm sorry. Just erase my... <laughs> why do you think blockchain will practically fit to your products and business? And uh, what pain points can you solve on your business by blockchain? Uh, who wants to start first? <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, so uh, in online poker, uh, traditionally there is a, a deposit and withdrawal process. And what centralized online poker sites become are essentially central banks. Uh, all player deposits are held by these entities and players have to trust that their funds are stored securely. Uh, so this is a really good use case uh, for blockchain technology, specifically smart contracts on Ethereum, uh, to remove that counterparty risk. So. Using a smart contract, you have a short-term escrow agent, and using a combination of this smart contract and a digital wallet owned by the user, players actually never have to deposit or withdraw money on our site, so they can uh, play safe knowing that their money is always secure. Very interesting. Now we'll do. Um, so the core, the core, there are two actually, two uses of blockchain for what we're doing. Uh, the first one is just the sheer transparency that it gives. Um, so recently, um, well over the last few years, it seems like every year there's a new charity scandal, particularly in the UK or the US. Um, and donors really want to know 
how their money is being used by charities, like what, what impact it's achieving, what goals it's achieving, and what our technology allows them to do is just have absolute certainty um, uh, of, of, of what the charity that they've given to has achieved with, uh, with the money. Um, and all of that is verifiable on the blockchain which is why it's really useful, but uh, the, the, the other application of it is the, is the crypto economics. So uh, it's like applied game theory, really. Uh, so this mechanism, for example, where donors uh, can hold their money in escrow or have the money held in escrow by a smart contract until the charity demonstrates that it's achieved its goals is, uh, is an incentive for charities to actually uh, provide the, the, the data about their impact. And actually, we're not just a donation platform. Um, really, it's all about uh, getting charities to share their data uh, and incentivizing people to then take all of that data, crunch it, and surface the most effective projects. Uh, so when there'll be lots and lots and lots of, uh, of social projects on the platform, it'll be very easy uh, to identify which ones are the best uh, because there'll be incentives in place for people to, to analyze the data. And you couldn't really do that without the blockchain. Uh, can I ask you an additional question for that? So, you know, from the data, you know, kind of data transparency perspective, how you know the blockchain technology will help you guys in compare with the existing like you know database technology like MySQL has kind of things. Right. Well, what happens today is that every single charity has data. If they're a good charity, they're measuring their impact, mm -hmm. and they have data about what they've achieved. Or if they have uh, funders big trusts or foundations that, uh, that have a big portfolio of, uh, of charities that they've given to, or if they have impact investors who are investing in, uh, in, in what they're doing and sort of systematically tracking the impact. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of those entities have visibility over what they're doing, but it's that all that data is stored in uh, in local databases, so it's it's not really ac accessible to anybody. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, the impact tends to be measured in very very different ways, uh, so you can't really compare. It's like comparing apples and oranges when you're trying to to do that. All of what, what that means is that when you're trying to do research on a good charity, uh, you end up doing spending a lot of money in due diligence mm -hmm. uh, if you can uh, get access to the data at all. Uh, so by breaking out those silos and systematically incentivizing all these players to share the data, it just makes it much easier for people to, to, to access the absolute no. best. No, got it. It's pretty cool. All right. Yeah. Could you help hold? Yeah, sure. So there are so many challenging problems in global supply chain field. Okay. Uh, so every year, the stakeholders in global supply chain lost almost five trillion dollars in potential revenue because of the disconnections really? in the wow. infrastructure. Yes, and it actually closely relate to everyone's life. Mm -hmm. When you order some goods right, and right. you can't check the status, or you get different kind of goods in different time, so it actually impacts everyone's life. Right. And uh, the problem that we are focusing on right now is the credibility of the small and medium-sized enterprises, mm. because those are the ones who normally have to go through very expensive agents mm. to get funded or get their transaction record verified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so every year there is about $1.5 billion trade financing gap. Mm -hmm. That is like an astonishing number. So we believe that public blockchain is the answer to that. So we have been relying on centralized agents, such, such as sourcing agents or banks for hundreds of years, and uh, it is not working. And there are so many inefficiencies. In China alone, there are 40 million small and medium-sized business that are underserved in terms of their financing situation. And you think about it, if you have a truly decentralized, trustless blockchain that every business can prove can put the proof of their business record on that blockchain mm -hmm. so that you don't have to only store your past transaction record with one buyer. Mm -hmm. Everyone else can go verify that record mm -hmm. and also banks or the potential lenders will have more confidence mm -hmm. um, to give you the loan as well. Mm -hmm. So we believe that is the answer mm -hmm. to solve the problems that we're having now. Everyone in the global supply chain field have to rely on the agents mm -hmm. to tell them who to trust, whether they can have the credit or not, no. and even pass on the information what to do next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. I didn't know that there is so much kind of cost correction there. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no, no, there's huge business opportunity there. Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So we're in the electricity business, um, electricity retail. So what we do on the blockchain really is we, we started doing it 
because we're looking for efficiencies within the system itself. Um, when you pay for retail electricity, the cost to serve every account um, is anywhere from 5 to almost 30% on what you're paying on every bill. If we could save that amount of money, that brings down the cost of delivery of power to you as a user. Mm. And that's why we started first. Mm. Um, when we started designing the, the platform we had, what we realized next was once we were able to move everything over to smart contracts, mm. that also opens the ability to allow people to trade power. And instead of talking just about microgrids, we designed a system that worked on a citywide grid, mm. uh, which is why we're also in Japan as well. Mm. Uh, we're talking to a couple of the, the big conglomerates here mm. to discuss executing the system for Japan also. Mm. So that's really interesting in a market like Japan because mm. like, um, there was a lot of solar development in the last few years, mm -hmm. but there was also a lot of feed-in tariffs from the government itself to incentivize this. Now these tariffs will end in 2019 mm. and all taper off. So what happens then is you're going to have a lot of um, solar asset owners mm -hmm. looking to increase their revenue. Mm -hmm. And what that will allow, what we will allow them to do is actually potentially look at them being able to sell that power directly over to consumers mm -hmm. through the Synergy platform that we've got. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we need the blockchain because mm -hmm. without the smart contracts mm -hmm. to execute all of these processes, it's far too expensive, far too difficult. Mm -hmm. Because energy trading has been occurring for last few decades easily between utilities but it's very, very expensive to do but with mm -hmm. smart contracts on the blockchain itself we crash the cost down to something very very simple mm -hmm. and can actually democratize the whole process mm -hmm. for everybody else now interesting thank you yeah please move to chris yeah so when you talk about usability of blockchain based solution we right now are still in the phase where you will use one dap buy one token use a bunch of plugins on your browser and hope it works. And if you can make one transaction, congratulations, you're one of 1% 1 of people in the world who has ever done that. Uh, and that may be okay for the investment phase, uh, the speculative phase of blockchain, mm. but we really want that user experience to be as common as smartphones and iOS app. Uh, we have a long way to go. So I think we have an orientation towards building not just something that's just as good as the mobile apps of today, but to acknowledge the power of blockchains, especially smart contract-based blockchain, to allow multiple domains of your life to come together. They're all, let's say, on Ethereum and working together. They can be cross-chain compatible between blockchain. But the user experience today, the impression is still each team will build their own app and hopefully you'll download it or you go to a website and install a plugin and good luck. So if we were to be able to unify the user experience through software development framework, plugins, and all these kind of technical terms, which is one aspect of it, we still have to solve the billing problem, which is how many tokens do you need to accept and approve to register a product into your crypto accounting system, mm -hmm. which intersect with your own private database, which could be traditional, mm -hmm. with some price feeds, mm -hmm. with your assets on chain, uh, smart contract keys. Uh, that gets pretty complicated as far as the actual billing model. So what we use is that we use a uh, Ethereum-based uh, smart contract to create essentially a prepaid card where you stick a certain amount of uh, token, we call it cost stack token, short for card, mm -hmm. kind of like prepaid card. And then based on which application you end up needing to use at any given time, uh, the provider, that could be a decentralized application or could be a cloud provider, would deduct from that pool using both on-chain and off-chain proofs mm -hmm. to say, hey, I, I have offered this amount of service to this user. Mm -hmm. So please make a ledger of it. Mm -hmm. And later on, and we do it later on so that we can aggregate it up and also reduce the amount of on-chain transactions, mm -hmm. we'll settle out, okay, $40,000 go to your platform, $30,000 go to your platform, and $100,000 was donation from the goodwill of the people. Awesome, right? And that means that we really want to use uh, this smart contract so that one company is it's not in charge of saying, I am Google, I determine how much you get paid, how much you get paid, how much you get paid. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, you get demonetized, right? Mm -hmm. That is a problem, right? Uh, and, and with smart contract, we can do it in a way that can be uh, uh, at the control of the community uh, and it's fair, it's transparent, it's based on data generated on-chain and off-chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of potential to build something much bigger than an app store, mm -hmm. something much bigger than 
than an advertising network, something much better than a SaaS exchange like what Salesforce.com run within their uh, 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 platform to allow people to sell their wares, but only if you buy into the Salesforce business model and technology stack and programming languages. I believe we can have a cross-chain collaboration mm -hmm. that still leads to this mm -hmm. kind of cohesive experience and blockchain can help us mm -hmm. kind of bridge from the metering billing aspects mm -hmm. of it which I think is crucial right interesting so you know from the uh, kind of a network congestion issue coming up in the decision right now so some people started using like an other alternative on the blockchain right now like in a theater or something so from that perspective your service is more like a focus on like a multi-platform for the blockchain and then you know decrease the affliction of the for the user side about you know operational adaptation stuff on a, a switching like a cross chain transaction yes so it, it would be possible for example to start out with let's say an accounting system where you're using a traditional database to mm -hmm. store your portfolio and mm -hmm. later on if there's a good idea uh, to do that in a more transparent public way mm -hmm. uh, you can just change oh am I use that new blockchain on that new platform to do that mm -hmm. uh, so we provide that kind of abstraction again mm -hmm. nothing new in IT and computer science if you build abstraction microservices you get to switch out uh, components as you need but I think this really allows us to achieve a goal of what we call de uh, progressive decentralization mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we don't need all the blockchain technology to work from day one mm -hmm. we can start with things that we've proven to work the payment mm -hmm. stuff uh, and then reuse mm -hmm. databases and analytics system that we know works today mm -hmm. but as the blockchain the decentralized alternative and mm -hmm. the individual ecosystem being built and innovated mm -hmm. outside the stage when the people working on platforms mm -hmm. we can switch out and bring those into the user without any additional friction that they have seen. I see. So from the perspective, what do you think, you know, sorry, I, I have one more question for that. So what do you think about the atomic swap? Because it's kind of a hot topic for like, you know, switching the uh, exist, uh, the one browser and the other browser uh, in the token economy. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of talk about two blockchain working together autonomously without you touching it. Mm -hmm. Like you just set it up. Uh, it's like saying that I'm going to post something to this, you know, social media network and have automatically send an email. 90% mm -hmm. of the time is what I want, 10% of the time is not what I want. Mm -hmm. So what's really interesting about it is that we take an approach that the cross-chain interaction really should go through the user, mm -hmm. or at least the user agent, mm -hmm. under the user control. Now you can mm -hmm. automate that agent, you can write your own AI on it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not really something that's autonomous, programmed once and never changed. So we see the adapters into the blockchain as a user user representative, a user proxy versus a don't worry about it, we'll just trade between this chain until you realize that drain it because we are off by one on some math, right? Um, so we really believe that we need to bring it to the user space, give them the opportunity to act on it through a UI or through an agent and AI that they choose. So that determined that architecture that we see ourselves as a client of the blockchain and not an overlord of the blockchain as some of the atomic uh, swap platform is focused on. Got it. Very interesting. Thank you so much. It, so let's move to the uh, second question. So this is kind of my, you know, hottest question in my mind right now. So here is now Lightning Network for payment use cases and Plasma Cash for pro and contract use cases. And how do you apply this new technology to your block products? And is there any still technical challenge there? And then what are those challenges? I think probably, Ryan, you should be the first because your use case is very interesting. <laughs> uh, so. The way that our system currently works is uh, a player needs to send a transaction on chain when he or she joins a table at the end of each hand and when a player leaves the table. And that requirement at the end of each hand is so that the contract can update, you could think of it as a chip counter, so it knows the player stakes at the given table. And that middle requirement is prohibitively expensive. Mm. Um, so we're looking into, right now the Plasma MVP is out and it's still in its early stages, but we're looking at uh, utilizing this type of off-chain settlement so that mm. the only time that an on-chain transaction actually needs to occur is when reconciliation is due. So uh, when a player uh, wants their payout, so when they leave a table or mm. when a tournament is ended. Uh, so it's still very early stages. Uh, our, our team is currently in, in uh, close contact with uh, the Ethereum Foundation, the guys working on Plasma, uh, and we expect it to take a, an additional few months before we integrate that into our current solution, but it's 100% needed for us to be economically viable, uh, as you know, current gas costs would be prohibitively expensive for every single hand having to charge you know, 50 right. cents USD. Right, right. <laughs> it's very convincing. I love this use case, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I 
completely agree with that. So w when we ran our pilot last year, um, we had to weather a few things. We had to weather CryptoKitties, we had to weather uh, a couple of ICOs that really severely um, dragged on the uh, <coughs> on the usability of Ethereum. And uh, from a user experience perspective, that can be really problematic. Um, so uh, the charity that was running the appeal called St. Mungo's, which is a London-based charity, uh, they actually sent the appeal out to, to normal normal people, uh, so not crypto geeks. Um, and the, the, the way that the donations were made were just by plugging in their credit card details. Now, if you have to wait five minutes every time that you make a donation, just a lot of people get, get puzzled by that. And then um, actually the computations that we need to do every time there's a validation. So what happens is uh, the charity achieves its goals, it helps someone find a home, for example, and every single one of those uh, claims by the charity has to be approved by a validator, which in the case of the pilot was the Greater London Authority, so the, the, go the local government of London. And what happens there is that uh, the local, the GLA, as they're called, uh, sends a transaction to the smart contract, says, yes, this has been approved, and uh, do the payout to the charity. And that iterates over all the donor accounts um, and pays out to the charity. So, and just that sheer computation at the, at the height of the, of the network clog was something like 40 or $50 worth of gas, which uh, is obviously really unsustainable. It's like much lower now, um, but, but that's the way it is. So we actually adopted a, a hybrid solution uh, where we uh, we synced all of the donations asynchronously so it wasn't done immediately it was just done as and when it was possible which means that it wasn't fully decentralized it still isn't fully decentralized we register things on our servers and then sync it to ethereum and little by little we are going to fully back into into the network uh, but so we're uh, just like you guys we're looking at a, a range of different things um, we had to redevelop some things to try to take some computation off chain, and uh, we're, we're looking actively looking at different different solutions. But for the time being, we're maintaining that hybrid structure. No, got it. Just thank you. Cool. So um, Plasma is really interesting for us because with Plasma Chain, we will be able to do some interesting computation and uh, supply chain applications off chain. Uh, and although we are building our own blockchain, we're actually building on top of Quorum, which is essentially a fork of Ethereum, meaning that uh, once Plasma uh, is fully developed, we'll be able to pull the changes and integrate into our uh, blockchain infrastructure. Um, however, I do believe that um, the payment, uh, the, light, the, the light, light, uh, the, the network, yes. lighting network. Yes, the lighting network as well as plasma, they all belong uh, to the category of um, off-chain channels, right? Mm -hmm. I do believe that the scalability issue have to be addressed mm -hmm. both on the uh, off-chain off channels mm -hmm. as well as the on-chain. <laughs> on-chain storage as well as processing as well. Mm. What if uh, everyone tomorrow, like everyone, uh, there is emergency situation, everyone has to redeem their tokens on mainnet. Mm. So we still have to solve the issue of uh, on-chain scalability and that's why we need sharding. Okay, ah, oh, sharding something. Yeah, okay. so you're asking about what are the other challenges that mm -hmm. we're foreseeing, right? Mm -hmm. So one is sharding, mm -hmm. the other thing is about uh, interoperability, cross-chain communication, Mm -hmm. okay, and uh, many, many people have asked me, so Hope, um, how are you planning to let all the companies to trust, mm -hmm. trust your blockchain and right. put their data on? First of all, we have privacy layer, but secondly, um, what I'm telling, the answer I'm giving to them is really easy because for all the stuff that you need private, like private data or you want to handle your own compliance issue, put on your own blockchain or your internal system, but to put your uh, put the, de the information that you need public verification mm -hmm. or process mm -hmm. on our public blockchain. Okay. So that's why we need the cross-chain communication so that our public blockchain can actually connect to all the privately held blockchain mm -hmm. and the companies and all the small businesses can still enjoy the fully um, di distributed no, trustless no. system. No, no. So it's kind of a little bit different from the off-chain transaction, but like, you know, combination from the uh, I know, I would say like a private admin swap transaction between public blockchain and private blockchain. That's one of the topics you have to focus on your business. Yeah, so basically mm -hmm. what we can do on the public blockchain is mm -hmm. to show the proof 
that those business also transactions more happen. Transparent way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. So that everyone can verify that. Mm -hmm. But we understand that there are many companies because of their compliance yeah. issue and Doesn't their data privacy there, issue. Yeah. Most of the business mm. makes more sense to mm -hmm. be handled privately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why uh, there is. There is, uh, this, this is one of the things that uh, mm -hmm. we look forward to working with other projects to solve mm -hmm. is about the cross-chain connectivity. So. I see. Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone who is working on that kind of technology right now in the blockchain? Oh yeah, like quite a few friends of us in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. Yeah, in, uh, so including like, so Wanchen did the great presentation mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Aeon project, they have their public test net up already. Oh, so I yeah. I see. Mm. Right, interesting. Mm. Yeah, this uh, is another new you know, pain point in this industry right now. Yeah, so because there are so many issues that we discuss in this mm -hmm. space, we do believe that, I agree with Chris, that uh, we should work together mm -hmm. and uh, uh, contribute on top of each other's work so Very we true. can focus on our public chain while like other projects mm. focusing on their field and it's all open source and the entire ecosystem will improve. And I think that's also the beauty of the blockchain ecosystem. Yeah. Very true. Mm. Thank you so much. That's a great comment. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm just going to add to that as well. Right. Um, the whole blockchain space is incredible so far. Mm. If you compare this against the traditional tech guys, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Every time you have a conversation with somebody, mm. um, it's an NDA, we will sign your NDA, oh. you sign my NDA, hi, and hi. then we'll only talk right. about four line <laughs> items and that's it. We're not going to share anything else. Huh? But what's incredible about the blockchain community, and you hear that all the time, we talk about community, we talk about ecosystems, we're sharing a lot, and that's insane because that drives the speed of development and new innovation faster and harder. And it's, it's just incredible. Um, so I mean, let's go back to, to Plasma again, mm. right? Mm. Um, the energy space is a little bit different from some of your applications. Mm. Um, a lot of the other applications talking about transactions firing as fast as they can, basically to catch a small window of time for which the transactions to occur. Mm. For electricity, it's a little bit different with really, utility billing entity. Mm. So what we look at in this space really is this, there's a lot of latency. You're going to have probably the rest of the whole month, for example, if you're billing on a monthly cycle transaction, until all the bills come in and wham, suddenly across the whole city, I've got probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bills going through simultaneously within a very, very small window. So several problems occur. When that loads up a blockchain, for example, right, cost per transaction goes up, it skyrockets, that's one. Then there's going to be a bottleneck. It's going to be crypto kitties all over again every single month, every month, right? Right. Um, and that's no fun. Then everybody else suffers. So, which is why something like Plasma, for example, makes a lot of sense. We're developing um, our solution together with Misego. Mm -hmm. uh, we're likely going to be a layer three on top of the layer two, or under the layer two um, mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. So, what's going to happen, what we imagine to be is this. For electricity, like I said earlier on, mm -hmm. because of the use of blockchain, because of the use of smart contracts, we're able to crash the cost of transaction on right. every account. So, by doing so, cost is going to be very, very important. Mm -hmm. So Plasma is going to be very, very key mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. um, then what we're looking at also is the ability to have more granular data. Mm -hmm. So one thing we're looking at now we're developing is a piece of hardware called the PowerPod. Uh, we've mentioned some of that online as well. We've shown some hardware, some of the dashboard images. Mm -hmm. And what that's looking to do is be able to capture and transmit and lock in a lot of the detail, a lot of the data mm -hmm. from generation itself. So part of the story really is that we're able to show provenance, mm -hmm. the source of this energy itself. And that's very, very key. Mm -hmm. Because like in the Japan context, for example, right here, uh, what happens a lot with the big power companies, they aggregate the power that they're buying from a lot of solar facilities. A lot of investors who have um, solar facilities mm -hmm. sell the power wholesale right. to some of these big generation companies. <laughs> and the interesting thing is this, that there isn't a lot of, there aren't very many models done where they're actually separating the energy and selling that as a premium. What they're doing is they're blending the cost of that mm -hmm. into conventional power itself. So what you end up buying <coughs> over here in this market, for example, is, is a blended cost of power, mm -hmm. which need not necessarily be the case. Mm -hmm. You either can get it cheaper because there's a cheaper source of power, mm -hmm. or someone is willing to pay a premium, for example, American or European MNCs mm -hmm. looking for sustainable energy sources, mm -hmm. they will pay a premium for it. And there are models for this, mm -hmm. right? And that premium goes to promoting renewable mm -hmm. and sustainable energy sources. Right. So that's right. important. So the provenance of energy is important as well. So all these transactions get locked in. So that is part of the architecture. I see. Uh, let me ask you an additional question. Now. So you mentioned also like, you know, for us, sort of business market in Japan right now. And then, you know, to me, in my understanding, when you're going to apply like a second layer of transactional system, 
like a Lightning Network to the solar, you know, marketplace or something, we can apply more like, you know, geographically P2P transaction in an off-chain model, right? So which is also like a more, uh, to me, like, you know, I know, there are economic viability there, why we can need to apply like, you know, blockchain technology to the you know, solar, solar, solar energy supply chain system. Is that correct? So things can be done off-chain. It can be done through a centralized system, of mm. course, mm. right? But the idea really is that Think of it as very, very simply this. If a company A mm. built a network, built a system, mm -hmm. it only grows so far. Mm -hmm. It only has so much penetration into market and so much uptake. Mm -hmm. If you built it as a public network mm. that anyone else can plug in, that right. benefits everybody else. Right. And, the and further to that really is that if it's a public network, the core infrastructure itself, under underlying layer of technology, mm -hmm. That is built once and used many. Mm -hmm. Like in the energy retail industry right now, mm. everything is centralized. Mm -hmm. Every single retailer has to have their own CRM systems, their billing systems, invoicing systems, mm -hmm. their tracking systems. Um, like in Singapore, a system called the EBT, the architecture, mm -hmm. which connects a retailer to the central intermediary. Mm -hmm. So over here in this market, there's the same system as well. That allows a retailer to pull the live consumption okay. data off the big power companies right. or the grid itself. Right. All these systems being centralized means that every single company mm. replicates this cost mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Now, in Singapore, there are 31 retailers right now. Okay. In Japan, there are over 400. So can you imagine that cost being multiplied 400 times? Mm. What's that cost? In the Singapore context, for example, we're looking at cheap end. Low end, you get a, a very economical, low price dev to build it. Mm -hmm. You're looking at about two to 300,000 bucks mm. easily. At the high end, you pay someone like Oracle to build it, that's running into like 3 million. So multiply that across every single retailer, no, okay. and that's insane. So that's the problem with the centralized system. It's incredibly expensive, right. hard to maintain, and not everybody buys into the same system. Then you have interoperability problems, no, okay. right? My data doesn't sync up with yours. We have different metrics for measuring, right. and then what happens? Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Convincing use case. There are a lot of business opportunities there. Great. Uh, yeah. You want to do, Chris? So I think one one really interesting thing when I hear the different use case of, of uh, kind of additional scalability is uh, level twos are typically sharding and like more chains. Uh, but one of the things that people forget is that blockchains are a type of online you know, transaction processing type of database, OLTP type of database. Uh, and 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 what about analytics? What about crunching numbers and we auto automatically assume that analytics will be a centralized system or most of them are currently one. But what's really interesting if you just kind of zoom out again, look in the more future view and look at what is the most innovative, uh, 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 the last 10 years, what drove the most innovation in analytics? Mm -hmm. And it's GPUs, right? Mm -hmm. GPUs in uh, machine learning and aggregation and, okay. and accelerated database that runs in memory. Uh, the question is, who has the most deployed GPU in the field? Crypto. So that's a, you know, once you look at it, it's almost like there's a natural resource mm. where we're using 100% of the deployed mm. capacity of GPU mm. for essentially not computation, right? Mm -hmm. We're using it in support of the trustless mm -hmm. computation that runs on the Celeron next to your mining rig, mm -hmm. right? That's essentially how small the processing power is. So one way to kind of continue moving towards what's coming next in level two, mm. uh, layer two, mm. beyond plasmas and, and cross-chain interoperability, mm. is to see if we can take those GPUs that's mm -hmm. in, in place and actually do some of the number crunching that's necessary to crunch down energy data, to figure out supply chain raw details, to look at, you know, kind of spiky web traffic from donation uh, and reduce it on those chips before we bring it to the chain. Uh, that's just one of the many techniques of bringing data analytics. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you bring in GPU-based data analytics, you bring in GPU-based governance, mm. AI governance onto this network. So instead of just saying, I will slash your stake because your transaction volume is greater than three or mm -hmm. less than three, mm -hmm. we can start looking for patterns mm -hmm. on top of this data. Mm -hmm. And these are all the things that are possible once we unbound ourselves to the particular design choices made mm -hmm. on the VM and on the you know kind of opcode and go a little bit finding the parallel within the centralized cloud computing mm -hmm. world and say, can the blockchain provide a new raw resources, mm -hmm. taking a portion of the GPU uh, capacity deployed mm -hmm. and making better use of it. Mm -hmm. And I know NVIDIA is very interesting in things mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's, I think, some of the new area research mm -hmm. that I think as a community we can work on together. 
That's so interesting. Uh, I think now I'd like to ask an additional question for that. So, you know, if we're going to take like, you know, those kind of, you know, well, blockchain economy, all the time we have to think about the privacy issues. So, you know, we have to see the balance between like, you know, but data transparency, but also like an anonymity and anonymousness of the, the transaction. So how you see, you know, those feature or, you know, that, the, you know, most of dApps player have to take care of it. Yeah, so right now dApps are typically uh, ch uh, built on one or a maximum two chains, right? Mm. We have a lot of similar model where you use ELC20 and Ethereum blockchain mm. for your primary staking kind of like, you know, model. And then you have a faster chain to do metering. Like that's mm. pretty much mm. the norm here. Uh, but I do believe that some of the chains that's currently working on privacy technology deeply embedded within mm. it can be used for certain use cases, such as customer data don't go to these more, mm. you know, more traditional chains. Chain, but go to this third chain mm. or fourth chain. Uh, and that's why it's so important for us to be able to co build this cohesive experience mm -hmm. where even though we're tapping into various pool of researchers on level one, mm -hmm. layer one, and then building new solution for scalability in layer mm -hmm. two, and maybe three, as you mentioned, uh, that we should really pick out the best of breed of you know, different blockchain database mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of the, uh, of the audience's IT architects or solution architect, uh, you analyze all the cloud service providers' features and databases and networks and storage and determine what is the right mix for your particular application. Mm -hmm. And I see, I see that happening in the blockchain or decentralized mm -hmm. world where an architect, you know, the team members who work with you will say, oh, I want to use this privacy-oriented smart contract platform mm -hmm. when one exists mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, deployed in mainnet uh, for that type of customer data and we'll row up and then we'll use some sort of cross-chain mm -hmm. to row up the sum which would have taken away all the you know personal identifiable data and settle out on let's say an Ethereum blockchain so that people will get paid and that could even be delay settle in the way you mentioned, right? So that's a type mm -hmm. of orchestration and design that will become much and much more part of that blockchain design the same way it's part of cloud design and system architecture design. Mm. Uh, and I think it would be healthy to be able to have people on top, uh, you know, working on solution, looking at all the innovation. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you have deep research happening in each of the pockets of the area mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make those things possible. Right. Does anyone want to add, you know, these privacy or, the, you know, anonymous city staff? Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, so privacy is really important. So mm. what I was saying about uh, transparency is obviously really important because we want all the, the impact data mm. about the charities available to everybody. So mm. you can check whether they're actually doing something good and improving people's lives. Mm. Um, but when it comes to uh, the private data mm. of the beneficiaries, mm. um, you want to obviously keep that hidden. Uh, but at the same time, you want to give these people a voice. So let's say, let's take a really naive example where there's a, a charity that says that it's building a, a well somewhere for a local community. Uh, it's validated by a validator, but, uh, but actually that validator is corrupt. Ooh, ooh. Um, hi, hi, you hi, want hi. to be able to allow the people from the community to be whistleblowers there, uh, but without like exposing all of their personal data on the, on the public blockchain. Um, and, and it's a hard problem to solve. It involves like uh, self-sovereign identity, all kinds of things. There's a bit of fragmentation in this space, which is, which is hard to solve as well. And um, we're, we're at the moment, we, we want to grant from the UK government, Innovate UK, to work with Imperial College London's uh, cryptocurrency research group to look at different ways that we can encrypt uh, that data, um, encrypt the, the proof around, so if you're helping a child find an adoptive uh, family, uh, you also want to, to, to keep those proofs um, secure, uh, available only to validators and authorized parties, um, and ideally you want to do it on a, in, a, in a decentralized storage. So I think there are lots of different ways that that can be done, but certainly all the compatibility issues, um, the cross-chain issues, uh, and all of this are, are, are really hard problems, and just to echo what Hope was saying, you know, it really is an amazing uh, space for uh, that kind of open source stuff. So everything that we do obviously is also open source mm -hmm. and we're building on, on the findings of lots of other teams as well. Great, fantastic, thanks so much. Okay, so uh, I'll move to the next question. This is actually from Palin. So, uh, everyone, do you guys also did DAZ or did ICO, right? All of you guys. Oh, you done not know ICO yet? Okay. What's wrong? 
um, we the, the ICO is planned for there will be an ICO but at a, at a but much later date. Okay, got it. So this is a question about the token economy. So the you know ICO and the DAP is correct, you know also getting very hot uh, topic right now. And then but here is like an issue about you know the, also the definition of the to you know, token token is also important like a security token or payment token or UT token. But also like you know uh, skip, skip your, uh, speculative trading on the token economy is one of the, the biggest problem on the blockchain right now. So how do you see about those issues? Like, you know, scapegoat investment token or like a more UTD payment or, you know, token for token kind of for real life. Yeah, right. sure. I'll, uh, so our, our token sales cup coming in, uh, in about 20 days. Mm. And what we're okay. doing to address that issue head on is uh, we aren't doing any type of pre-sale discount bonus and our tokens aren't transferable until, until our main net launch. Mm. Um, and we felt that these factors uh, enable us to grow a community of interested people who want to help uh, see the Virtue Poker platform grow versus the people who come in to, uh, with other people in pool to get a discount to then flip the tokens on an exchange one week later. Uh, and I think this is where the industry is going to move. I think the speculative element of token sales in the past uh, has uh, created a... Uh, a sore in the industry and has, and has triggered the, the regulatory response that we've seen worldwide. Right. Maybe just to add to that, I think it's a really important issue for us as well that the reason why we're not doing an ICO straight away is for exactly uh, that reason. So we're in the middle of, a, of an equity fundraising round at the moment. Mm -hmm. And some of the some of the investors that are coming in are impact investors who will also be clients of Alice uh, further down the line because it's donations but it's also impact investments and if you're a traditional impact investor, so impact investors are just traditional investors who have a double bottom line. They want a financial return but they also want a social return oh. uh, and our platform solves a whole host of problems for them uh, but they understand equity, oh. uh, they don't understand tokens, they don't even know how to get that onto their balance sheets, right? Oh. So doing an equity round is oh. basically a way to educate them oh. on that, get them used to the platform, get them using the platform as well. Oh. So we'll issue the tokens before we do the ICO as well and then little by little hopefully we can we can get them on board without having just a bunch of speculators who want to flip um, uh, our tokens as soon as they come out. I see that's an interesting approach. Great. So we didn't do ICO either so we raised a private round from strategic contributors uh, as well as future customers mm -hmm. so basically we check each one's background and talk to them to make sure that they either A, can bring uh, supply chain connections on our platform, or B, their company themselves, they're just oh. gonna use the product. Mm -hmm. So this is um, what people are, have been using the buzzword, utility token, mm -hmm. it's like you want to play a Candy Crush game, mm -hmm. right, on the App Store, and then you buy mm -hmm. <laughs> the, I don't know, is that a Candy Crush coin or the Candy Crush points? I, mm. I forgot what it is, mm. right? Mm. Because it's all, almost like you go to a salon and you buy a membership, up front, you pay up front mm. because you're supposed to use that in the mm. future. Mm. So for us, it was really important that the tokens distributed mm. to mm -hmm. the bis people who own business mm -hmm. or have connection to those business who are going to use mm. the functionality. Right. It's going to be paying those tokens as, you know, a, service fee on our platform mm -hmm. yeah this is actually a very good point because you know all the time when i'm thinking about the token economy it's like a ideal token economy should be designed like in a circulation of the stakeholder or circulation or supply chain economy of the stakeholder so you just you know working on those kind of you know approach to you know issue a token and you know get the money from them that's very interesting so I was trying to, when I explained, try to explain people the utility token, normally mm -hmm. I start with the Candy Crush <laughs> coin or like Salon membership. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that's like normally how people mm -hmm. get to understand the difference mm -hmm. between those mm -hmm. uh, and like the actual investment, um, you know, the actual investment stuff. Because you don't expect a return, mm -hmm. right? You don't expect a return when mm -hmm. you buy the Candy Crush point that you're going to be using yeah. to, uh, to play the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally true. Because actually, he's not here, but uh, you know, Richard Moore, the CEO of the Quantstamp. All the time, you know, we're gonna discuss each other about that topic too. So it should be like, you know, this is kind of should be a hot topic, you know, token economy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You want to do? So we 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 ran an ICO. Almost embarrassed to see it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we we ran an ICO. Uh, we closed it and and uh, the twenty third of Feb. Um, and what we did was very similar to that. What we did when we ran the ICO, there were no bonuses paid out at any level. I want to be fair to the community. It was a community building event. 
Um, we did have a, a private sale kind of a round, but we kept that to only just um, two thirds of all the tokens that we released. There were no bounties, no bounties paid out either. So everybody came in on even playing field and got the same rates. And that we wanted to put a lot more tokens in circulation and so on. Mm. Um, we also put in investing periods for some of the, the bigger consumption because you didn't want people to go in and do the typical pump and dump. Mm. Um, and it, it was a hard decision to make at the time. Because at the time when we started and we said uh, we won't pay out bounties and everything else, we actually turned some people off. Um, some people came up and they, there was some name calling as well. Mm. Um, but um, we, we made the call to do, do it. At the time it was a marketing thing. Everybody else was giving a lot of bounties and so on. And mm. It was, it was kind of mm. crazy. Right. But uh, we're quite glad we did it mm -hmm. because um, again, it, it's all interconnected, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we had a very, very long conversation yesterday mm. about the token economy and mm. everything else and mm. what it ties mm. into. It's not just about the speculative component mm. of it mm. because you got to realize a lot of the entities raising funds, some of the companies are mature and running an ICO. But by and large, most of them are brand new. The new entities, mm. young companies, like mm. ours is about a year old. We had an existing business model and so on. But what's really important for all these companies really is to get first dollar in. Right. Improve your concept, get it out there, build a business, get revenue in. Mm. After that, then we can talk about looking at the appreciation of that token itself. Mm. Because then the token is part of the economy. <laughs> we got business in, it's using that token. Right. There's a velocity of money essentially. That's what we're talking that's about, right? right? Kinsen right. economics, right? Yeah. So that's the movement of the token within the system itself. Right. There's the demand and the consumption. Right. That's the natural use of the token. Right. Not the speculative component. Mm -hmm. So that natural use takes tokens out of their circulation within the ecosystem itself mm -hmm. and then circulates it within. So right. that's what's more important. Far, far more important. I agree with you. And also that kind of thing is also built the ownership for the token holder. Exactly. For the ecosystem. Exactly. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think when we look at like fast forward three or four years, uh, you know, there will be utility in the utility token. A lot of the project would have shipped. Uh, some of the ones that are uh, on stage would have shipped at the time of the release of the token and they will interoperate. Uh, but one of, one of the most important thing is that eventually the money cash flow that's going into traditional economies, traditional billing system, and for example, in our field, into traditional software as a service subscription, mm -hmm. will start going into token-based mm -hmm. ecosystem. And when you start seeing that substitution of cash flow funneling away from traditional billing and metering and traditional donation into token economy, then there is no doubt that utility token wasn't a scam. It's just that we need to accelerate that and reduce the gap between the promise and the delivery. Mm. Now, obviously, we, we abide by a similar principle. We're in, in the middle of pre-sale. We've done a public pre-sale, uh, and we are going to wait until we can say, you can redeem software and services mm. with the Costack token as you would with a web hosting company on the day the token is unlocked. That's utility value. That's substitute mm. utility value. Mm. It's a utility that you would have paid mm. your registrar or Google or hosting company that you're now paying the token economy that's now not controlled by single company's terms of service mm. that's now governed by community-driven smart contract. Mm. That, I believe, is the turning point where people see the utility as not just, oh, what, a, what utility do you make up in the lawyer's office, but more like, <laughs> oh my God, this is actually not possible before. This type of organization of people and interest and alignment, not only within one project, but across the project, uh, that's when I think we can really say confidently the blockchain has arrived. Great, thank you so much. It's just a fun art session. <laughs> uh, maybe just we can open one question to the audience. It's uh, sorry, it's running out of time right now. So just one question. Does anyone? Is that okay? Are you through now? <laughs> Great. Uh, someone? Sorry. sorry. Hello. Okay. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm Tyg, I work for Zcoin, and I'm building a zero coin into Ethereum, which is a privacy solution. I are discussing privacy solutions there. Mm. Um, I just have a question for the Virtue Poker uh, team. Okay. Um, I have the problem at the moment of actually trying to build randomness into the contract. Um, it's a big problem, and I know that you discussed that you have a type of off-chain solution that does card shuffling. Um, I was just kind of wondering if you could go into a bit more detail about how that works. I think it's well known that generating randomness on chain is a <clears throat> incredibly difficult problem. 
Um, and I was wondering maybe you could just describe what your process is for doing that. Uh, oh. Sure, yeah. So our the, the way that we derive randomness is uh, completely off-chain. Uh, the app is actually a state engine, so all players seated at a, at a table are running the same code at the same time. Uh, and we use, it's called a, a mental poker protocol uh, to uh, cooperatively encrypt and shuffle the deck of cards. So the process is every single player actually shuffles the deck for each hand played on the platform. Uh, we use the uh, random number uh, algorithm URandom. Uh, so essentially the noise from the user's machine. Uh, and this process is repeated for you know n players who are seated at a particular table. So all the players perform a peer-to-peer -peer subnet, uh, and this process goes on for every single hand uh, played on the platform. So we actually don't, we, di we didn't try to tackle uh, the on-chain RNG. I know a, a couple of uh, other uh, online gaming companies in the space have, have gone that approach, but uh, that's partially why we, we went in our direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. So this is all about the session. So thank you very much, guys.